Welcome to episode 56 of the How To Japanese podcast. I'm Daniel Morales, and it's October 2024. We made it. Uh, it's finally, finally, almost fall in Osaka. Uh, we had yesterday, or yeah, yesterday was actually a really pleasant fall day. And then today, the temperatures creeped up, I think, an additional five degrees and kind of put us somewhere closer to what I might call like Chicago summer, not like a true fall. But now that the weather's here, I'm starting to feel my kind of energy levels rise up a little bit. Not fully used to it. Usually it takes me a couple of days to kind of sink in to the weather and get used to that different temperature. So I'm not, I still a little bit kind of lingering summer malaise, but we're almost out of that season. So um, I don't know if, if that's related or not, but this month I uh, dug deep into Kago. Uh, for the newsletter I have maybe that's re- weather related probably unlikely but for whatever reason I was inspired to write a little bit about Kago and before I go into my opinions I want everyone listening to kind of take five or ten seconds and really think about what your Kago experience has been like how have you learned about Kago how have you experienced Kago and I'm legitimately cu- curious to know and as a call to action to anyone listening, if you're feeling inspired by this exercise that we're about to do, these questions that I'm about to ask you all, email me at howtojapanese at gmail.com and let me know what your Kago experience was like. Also, you can reach out to me on social media. I'm at howtojapanese on just about every platform. Speaking of which, I took my Twitter private to, uh, recently just ahead of the change in the block rules. I'm not really blocking anyone particularly crazy. There's no stories behind that. I just thought that Twitter is really kind of a dumpster fire at the moment. And I've been determined to kind of uh, wait out the current ownership. And I'm still determined to do that. But with the block rules changing, I want to kind of go private for a little bit and just kind of see how things feel before going public again. So if, feel free to add me there. I'm, I'm not going to like prevent anybody from following me. So go ahead and add me there if you don't already follow me there and tweet at me with uh, your thoughts about Kego. Um, so now here's the exercise. Think back to when you first started studying Japanese. What were you aware of before you started studying? Was Kego something you had heard about? Um, was Or did you not know anything about it? Uh, and then what was your first studying experience? Was it in the classroom or did you start self-studying? If you were in the classroom, did your teachers wait uh, and introduce Kago after a few weeks or a few months? Or did it start much earlier in the course, you know, within the first couple of days or the first week? Uh, if you started self-studying, how did the textbook introduce it? At what point in the book, book did it get introduced? Was there a dedicated Kago section or did it get introduced as an ancillary idea to something else? How does Kago make you feel? Uh, was it something you were anxious about? And if so, why? Uh, was was it connected to the way that your teachers approached it? Or was it the opposite? Were you not worried about Kago at all? Uh, or did you remain blissfully unaware of Kago until you arrived in Japan and then were kind of forced to confront it? In my personal experience, uh, Kegel was definitely something to kind of like be afraid of. It was, um, uh, it was definitely a, a kind of a concern. Uh, not, I think, purposely, of course. The teachers didn't like make it into this kind of boogeyman. But something about the way that they introduced it, the sheer variety of different Kegel, and the sense that you might accidentally commit some kind of unforgivable uh, etiquette violation if you made a mistake, uh, made it extremely frightening. Uh, when the reality is that it's as easy to commit the same kind of social violations in English uh, and any other language as it is in Japanese. Uh, and so I don't think there's anything unique about Kego that uh, makes it any more frightening than any other language, to be honest. Uh, so much of these etiquette violations come down to tone, timing, and common sense. So this is one of the major mistakes I think that students make with Kago. They're too scared of it. It's uh, some frightening thing that instantly creates a barrier 
that you have to overcome. Uh, and I think that instead sh students should look at it not as a wall, not as a barrier, but as an obstacle course with multiple paths and multiple solutions. There is more than one way to solve the Kago equation. And when you start to think about it that way, you'll realize that Kago isn't this wall that needs one specific tool, like some kind of like grappling hook or a rope ladder or something to master, not one kind of tool. There are lots of different ways to get around the obstacles on the course. And they're all quite low to the ground. So the risk of falling is actually quite low. It's just a matter of which of these paths are open to you at the moment on your study journey. Which paths are easy and can you take those instead of the more complicated paths? The complicated Kago paths are actually very complicated. And I think that they feel that way because most of those paths involve verbs. And these verbs have to change forms and they just seem to get more and more subtle and nuanced and complicated. And uh, there's lots of diagrams too with arrows pointing different ways of people in various levels of a social hierarchy um, when it's not in fact that complicated. But verbs, I would say, you know, are relatively complicated, right? So this is like when you have a verb like kikimas, kikimas, which means to ask or to hear. And it can transform into a humble form by uh, transforming into okikishimas, okikishimas. Or you can turn it into an honorific form by uh, changing it to okiki ni narimas, okiki ni narimas. So that's the original verb is kikimas, and you can go okikishimas, okiki ni narimas, right? The first one is humble, the second one is honorific. So now you have to remember how to construct both of these forms. Right, not just for this verb, but for any other verbs that use the same construction pattern. And then you have to remember which one is which. Which, if you listen to the last uh, podcast I did about impossible pairs, maybe you'll realize that it isn't always the easiest thing to do to differentiate two extremely similar things in a foreign language. I think the other mistake that students make, uh, including myself, I think for a long time, was to mistakenly believe that every verb has a specialist kego verb, right? So you've got the verbs that will shift, like the one I just introduced, kikimas, which has the two different forms you can kind of like conjugate it in more or less. But then you also have these other verbs that have like 100% replacements to fancier verbs. Fancy verbs might be a good way to, to talk about kego, really, to be honest. Um, so a good example of this is taberu, Taberu, which means to eat. And you say that meshiagaru. Meshiagaru is an honorific form that you can use to address someone else about what they are eating. So you could say something like, Niku wo omeshiagarimasu ka? Niku wo omeshiagarimasu ka? Which would be a way to say, do you eat meat? Ask someone politely, oh, do you eat meat? Um, but you could also ask them, Niku wo tabemasu ka? And that would be perfectly polite for a reason I'll get into in a different, a different day. But if you needed to go fancy, Niku wo meshiagarimasu ka? Right? Would be a way to do that, right? So if this were true, right? If every verb like taberu had this fancy equivalent, that would effectively double all the verbs that you have to learn in Japanese, which would be a bit of a challenge. Uh, the good news is that this isn't the case. You have to simplify Kego, and I like to simplify it because, especially when it comes to verbs, because believe it or not, not all Kego is verbs. Uh, you have to think about almost every word in the language as, as Kego, but that's a topic for a different day. Today we're talking about Kego verbs, and the one simplification I like to make is this. Uh, when you use verbs in a language, you're only ever doing one of two things. The first is to describe an action that you yourself, the speaker, the writer, is taking. The verb is an action that you are doing and you're talking about it yourself to someone else, right? You're talking to somebody else 
about what you, the speaker, are doing. That's one way that verbs are used. The second thing that you do with language is to describe an action that someone else is taking. The verb is an action that someone else is doing, they're the subject, and you, the speaker or the writer, are talking about what that other person is are doing. That person can be a second person, you, or a third person, someone else, and you're talking to you about it, right? So that's, that's how, another way this gets complicated. You have a kind of uh, one direction conversation between a speaker and a you, second person, right? Or you can have introduce a third party and you're talking to somebody else about a third party. But today, let's simplify it even further and say, I am talking to one other person directly about what they are doing, right? So you only have two people in this conversation. And with verbs, you can either describe what I am doing or what you are doing. So if you break it down this way, it creates a simpler entry point for new students. I think especially students who are have no basis with the language. You give them a really uh, simple question to ask. And it's just one question. That is, who is doing the verb of the sentence? And that's going to determine uh, what kind of Kago you're using, right? So let me repeat that. You can simplify Kago by asking yourself, who is doing the verb of the sentence? Who is the subject of the verb in that sentence? Is it me, the speaker, or is it the you that I'm t addressing, right? Or in Japanese, that you could be Tanaka-san, right? Because you might say Tanaka-san's name instead of saying Anata, right? That's another totally separate conversation, important one to have for Japanese, right? So this is a binary, right? We can now simplify this Kago binary by using verb forms that are going to be respectful uh, for verbs that are actions other people are taking, and then humble verbs for the ones that we're doing ourselves. And I've been throwing around these words, humble and honorific, right? And that's because there are multiple different types of keigo and they all have names in Japanese, right? This is another reason why it gets complicated so quickly, right? Which is why we need a simple entry point. And this is providing it, right? By looking at verbs, seeing who the subject is and saying, do we need honorific keigo, which is son keigo, son keigo, which literally means honorific keigo. You can hear the keigo in son keigo honorific kego and this is the type of verbs that we use when we we are talking about the actions that other people are taking uh, this month in the newsletter i focused on the opposite of son kego the opposite of son kego is called kenjogo kenjogo which literally means humble language this is the kind of language that humbles your own actions relative to another person and fortunately, there is an incredibly useful Kenjogo verb that I think is almost like a kind of Swiss army knife uh, that's useful in a wide variety of different circumstances. Uh, it's not going to work for everything. So don't go out there after this podcast and try and use this with everything. But it will become useful in a, a, a wide range of different circumstances once you learn the kind of phrases you can use it in. This word is ukagao, ukagao, and it's what I wrote about in the newsletter this month. Ukagao has three core definitions, and those are to hear slash to listen, to ask, and to visit, right? And you'll see that these seem kind of very wide and disparate at first, but they all kind of come together at the end, I think, uh, and I think you'll see why. So let's look at the first definition. Here's a good sentence example that you can use with this kind of ukago. You can say, Sono hanashi wo ukagaimashita. Sono hanashi wo ukagaimashita. This literally means, I've heard that news slash information slash story. This is a very easy way to inform someone politely that you were aware of something, right? So you are the one doing this action. You do. Ukagao. Actually, I should have started started with that. Actually, you always do. The speaker always does the ukagao. You would never say you ukagao right directly to someone you're talking to. So when someone hears ukagao, 
they know that the speaker is talking about themselves, um, which is why you don't need a pronoun. Uh, you don't need to say I, because when you hear ukagao in Japanese, you know it's the person talking about themselves. They're humbling themselves relative to the person they're talking to, right? And in this case, you're saying I humbly, essentially humbly, I wouldn't ever include that in a translation um, because it's really just implied. You're saying I've heard that news, that story, but you're implying you're doing it in a humble way and you would use this in polite uh, circumstances, right? You can also mark who you heard it from with the particle ni. So this would be something like Tanaka-san ni sono hanashi wo ukagaimashita. Tanaka-san ni sono hanashi wo ukagaimashita. I heard that news from Tanaka-san. Uh, this is really useful if you're at work and need to let someone else know that you've heard something or uh, from whom you heard that information. And another example is if you wanted to check in on uh, news about a deadline. You could say, um, for example, you're talking to a teacher or an editor or something and uh, a coworker and you say, Tanaka-san ni ukagaimashita ga shimekiri ga ashita mitai desu. Tanaka-san ni ukagaimashita ga shimekiri wa ashita mitai desu. Which means, uh, I heard this from Tanaka-san, but it appears as though the deadline is tomorrow. And that would be a way to kind of start a conversation about, well, when is this deadline? I like to, I like to confirm it, but this is what I've heard so far. So it's very useful in a subtle way. Uh, without just jumping out there and saying, Shimekiri wa itsu desu ka? Right? When is the deadline? You can jump in and say, oh, this is what I know so far and I'd like to confirm it or something like that. The second meaning is also useful in a way that I've discussed previously, both in the newsletter and on my blog, which is one of my uh, Japanese teachers, my senior year of college, called this an airbag uh, expression. That's Kageyama sensei. I should shout her out by name. Uh, she called these expressions airbag expressions. And I think ukagao is a very useful verb to use in these airbag expressions. And what these are is are um, expressions that you can use before making a request of some of someone. And what they do is that they, they're kind of linguistic signals that give a heads up to the person that you're about to ask a question, right? So this would be something like, sumimasen ga, sumimasen ga. So after hear somebody hears sumimasen, they know that you're trying to get their their attention and they know you're, you're probably about to ask them something or maybe give them something they drop, but they're, they know that you're asking for their attention and they're turning on their kind of like attention mode. Another good example is kyoshiku desu ga, kyoshiku desu ga. And this is one I've written about for a long time, which is a extremely, almost sometimes too polite way to say, oh, it's terrible of me, but it's terrible of me, but, and so when someone hears that, they know some kind of like request is going to be made. And so they're preparing themselves and you're not just saying uh, whatever, straight out what your request is. Um, but I, I think you can expand this idea of airbag expressions to anything that helps prepare your conversation partner for what is going to come in conversation, right? So let me say that one more time. Language that helps prepare your partner for what's going to come in the conversation is useful language because it fits into these natural patterns. It gets your listener ready for what's going to come next. And I find that this is especially useful on the phone. If you're making a phone call, you need to set up your listener maybe more so than when you're in person, when you can give visual clues about what it is you're about to say. So on the phone, one of those things that you might say is kikitai desu ka? Kikitai desu ka? And you might add the n chisai n in there to make it sound even more natural. Kikitai desu ka? Kikitai desu ka? This literally means I'd like to ask, but, um, and this signals that you want to ask a question. And so it puts your, your, um, conversation partner in a question answering mode simply by saying that question. And now they're in this mode that they can now address your question in a more effective way. And you've done that with a simple piece of language. It's kind of amazing. You can level up kikitain desu ga by using ukagao. And that's uh, a slightly more humble, polite version. That's 
And that would sound like ukagai tain desu ga, ukagai tain desu ga, or just without the in, you would say ukagai tain desu ga. Uka, uka, my pronunciation is terrible there, so <laughs> let me do that one more time. Ukagai tai desu ga. It's not an easy word to pronounce, but I think it's one that's worth practicing. Ukagai tai desu ga. And that simply means I'd like to ask a question. Uh, you can make this more specific by adding nitsuite onto the front, right, to specify the topic about what you're going to ask a question about. So if you're in, if you're calling the city office about your pension payment, you could say something like, Nenki nitsuite ukagai tai desu ga. Nenki nitsuite ukagai tai desu ga. Which means I'd like to ask about pensions. I'd like to ask about pensions. Ninki ni tsuite ukagai tai desu ka to inform them that you have a pension question and then they would probably understand, oh, you know, no, that's not me. Let me uh, forward you to the pension desk, right? And you've, you've solved the, your problem before you even st- had a problem. And now you're talking to the pension person. You can use this again and then they know, okay, now I'm in question answering mode, right? So I mentioned that last month uh, as on the blog as a follow-up to kakunin, right? And you can use uh, kakunin in a very similar way. Kakunin stein desu ka, which is, you know, a very useful way to, to do one of these airbag uh, expressions. So that's the second definition, right, to ask. So, so far we have to listen, to hear, we have to ask, and we have this third definition, which is to visit. And the central way that this definition is used is to confirm a meeting appointment, I would say. So say, for example, you set up a meeting uh, at a specific time with somebody at their company or at another location. Uh, In Japanese, the most natural thing to do is to confirm that appointment and the appointment time, you know, maybe a week or or a few days before. Um, And this can either come, you know, I, you could also confirm it right at the end of the initial conversation where you're um, setting up the meeting just as a kind of final confirmation of the time and the date, right? Um, so you could use a sentence like this. Asatte asa juji ni onsha ni ukagaimasu. Asatte asa juji ni onsha ni ukagaimasu, which means the day after tomorrow at 10 a.m. I will visit your company. And as I was preparing this example sentence, I was kind of Googling what the best option was for that word that I used for your company, which was onsha. And there were, seemed to be two options. Onsha seemed to be the best. I th- there were also saw examples of kisha. Uh, these are both honorific ways about talking about someone's company that, and I don't have the kind of specific difference between these two. If anybody knows, uh, deep dive on the difference between onsha and kisha, feel free to chime in somewhere. I'd love to know more. But um, it's extremely useful in an email or uh, a phone. The other example sentence that I saw in the dictionary was kochira kara ukagaimasu. Kochira kara ukagaimasu, which literally means it's kind of this phrase that only makes sense literally in Japanese. Literal translations obviously never really make sense in English, but in this case, it feels a little bit foreign, which is I will visit from here. Kochira is often used um, as a pronoun all, a lot of times. So in here, it almost means I will be the one making the visit. And you're kind of emphasizing that with kara. I will be the one visiting you, right? And you're deferring your own action. You're, make, you're, you're providing some deference by saying ukagao, right? In the first place. But also kochira kara, I will be you know, deigning, uh, not deigning, I will be humbling myself to make the trek to your uh, company or something like that. Obviously, none <laughs> these, this is all very nuanced. It's just polite way. There's nothing um, foreign about these when you use them in Japanese. But in order to get some of that nuance in English, you end up adding words like hum- humbly and things like that, which just only exists in English in things like uh, the original Shogun novel. So, um so what do we have with these three core definitions? I think maybe if you haven't realized the central tie here, it's that they all provide uh, deference. This verb can be used in a number of different, stations, different situations and has a kind of built-in sense of deference when there is a kind of direction of information involved. 
right? Or a direction of movement of, of something, right? Uh, so whenever you've intaken something or whenever you're going somewhere, right? Whenever your question is, is moving from you to someone else, whenever news is moving from someone else to you, or whenever you physically are moving from somewhere to someone else, this ukagao is involved. And um, it has that natural sense of deference, which makes it a very useful, clear signal, not only about who's taking the action, but also that you are being very polite right now. So that's what I wrote about in the newsletter. I followed up a little bit on the blog this month. I try and find some other little nugget to include on the blog every month. So if you're not checking out howtojapanese.com, definitely uh, check that out as well. Check If you're not subscribed to How to Japanese on Substack, please do subscribe because I've got, I think like four or five people left and I'll be at 500 followers, which is pretty cool. Um, and so some of these other definitions that I wrote about on the blog are also worth noting and are kind of, some are ancillary to the Keigo definitions and I think some are unrelated. So ukagao, one of the other definitions that's listed in the dic dictionary is it can mean to check in on a group of VIPs or to address a group of VIPs. And one phrase that gets mentioned a lot for this definition is gokigen o ukagao. Gokigen o ukagao, which literally means something like checking in on some how someone's doing. Um, and it reminds me a lot of yosu o miru, which is a, a frequently used phrase, which means see how something or someone is doing or to observe how something is going or to wait and see how something goes. So that's yo suo miru, right? And here, again, you have that same sense of direction, right? Gokigen o ukagao. So you're kind of, there's this back and forth. You are going to see how someone else is, so this direction of attention from you to someone else. And then an intake of information as you see how they are and kind of like intake it and understand it. Um, ukagao can also mean to make a, to request a, dine, a divine message from the Buddha. So literally to ask for an oracle. Uh, I think this also ties in uh, with Kego. There's a sense of deference from human to God and it's similar to ask, right? So these, these two additional definitions are kind of tied in with that original Kago. Uh, and I'm just now realizing those two definitions I also wrote out on the newsletter. The next definitions are the ones that I wrote about on the blog. Um, these aren't in the dictionary definition. And I think that's related to the fact that they may use different kanji. So on the blog, that's that's really kind of what I looked at closely is how do the kanji work here, right? Because ukagao has a very set kanji, which resembles uh, nani, uh, missing one leg and um, one fewer strokes and uh, but definitely can cause confusion at first for for newbies but there are a couple other kanji that gets used and one of them is kind of strongly associated with the meaning that means to look through uh, in this case it borrows the same kanji as nozoku which also means to look through nozoku and ukagao can also mean this the same thing. It specifically means to look through an object at something else, so like through a peephole and a door or a telescope or maybe binoculars or something like that. So that's one of the kind of alternate ukagao kanjis that get used. The other kanji that gets used, I can't remember, if, I don't think this one has its own special verb like nozoku. There's, I think there's a couple other slightly more obscure compounds that it gets used in, but this one, when used with ukagao uh, means to secretly watch in a way so that you are not noticed. And actually this definition in Japanese uses yo suomiru to see how something turns out that I mentioned earlier, which I think gets at another definition that is only like kind of indirectly mentioned in the dictionaries and in all this material that I found. But that definition is to detect I think de detect is a way that you are going to encounter ukagao, especially in written Japanese. The form that you're likely to see this in, I think even broadly as academic writing and also just kind of basic nonfiction writing, uh, analytical writing, and that form is nani nani ga ukagaemasu. So it's the potential form of ukagao 
And on the front of that, nani nani ga ukagaimasu. So something can be detected. Something is possible to be detected. And also, nani nani koto ga ukagaimasu. So putting a longer phrase on front of that, nani nani koto ga ukagaimasu. So I googled that phrase and I found that it gets far more hits in hiragana actually than using a kanji. Uh, 1.8 million hits in hiragana compared to just 346,000 for the kanji that gets used in the compound. I just had to go look this up. Kichi, which means to infer slash deduce slash figure out slash understand. Although um, the kanji, if you replace it with the kanji that gets used in the core meaning of ukaga, which is uh, nani, which is similar to nani, right? That I mentioned previously with, with one less stroke. Um, it gets 3.25 million hits, uh, which makes me officially confused, right? So I think that it's a bit of a mixed bag with Ukagao. You'll see a lot of different kanji usages. Some will imply different things than others. And I think all often it's going to be up to the writer uh, trying to create a certain effect. Uh, but at any rate, here is an example sentence from an article about how tondemo arimasen is incorrect Japanese grammar. Uh, and yes, apparently it's incorrect and should be tondemo nai, but that's a, another separate topic. And also people just kind of use tondemo arimasen. Um, but here's that sentence. Kono yona koto kara nai wo teine ni yubai ni wa arimasen no ho ga yusen teki ni sentaku sareru keiko ni あることが伺えます。read a quick translation of that would be from this we come to realize or we can detect right that there is a tendency for arimasen to be selected preferably when saying nai politely, right? So this koto ga ukagaimasu means we come to realize, we can detect that, we understand that, we observe that, something like that. And I'll share a link to this article, which is pretty interesting in the links in the newsletter. But this structure, right, this koto ga ukagaimasu is a really nice structure and it's a very Japanese structure. So if you can find a way to um, use it in your own writing, if, if you're doing the right kind of writing, I wouldn't throw this into a work chat. It might be a little bit katai, a little bit too tight for that. But, right, so, um, but it's interesting. It shows the difference between Japanese and English, right? So in English, we have to make a subject and a verb choice. Right, so we have to put in we or I or people or something, whereas in Japanese you don't have to. So um, you could also go in English with one or it, right? It becomes evident. Uh, there's a lot of different solutions for this, and it really dep depends on kind of the kind of sentence you end up writing in English. For it. But that's not what we're worried about right now. We're worried about how the Japanese is working and the structure of the sentence. Right, and so it's basically in Japanese, it's kono yona koto kara, or even more simply, you can simplify all that to x kara y ga, or y koto ga ukagaimasu. Let me read that one more time. X kara y koto ga ukagaimasu. That's the kind of blueprint for this Japanese sentence. And I think it's... Um, great to kind of do this sentence defining activities really force yourself to break down sentences to understand how they're working and it shows here that the sentence uh if you translated that sentence breakdown into english it would be something like from x y can be detected understood learned observed uh, and this is strong uh, japanese sentence structure right it's a bit katai but you could use this in analytical writing during a presentation uh, so don't use it for your team's chats, uh, probably not in a daily conversation, but you could definitely like, maybe like take just, uh, and like use that to explain something you realized or noticed. Uh, or if you're like at an art museum on a date, this would be a, a 
a pretty fancy way to to talk about what you're taking from whatever piece of art you're you're looking at but um that basically covers everything i have to say about ukagao and all all its uses i i think um i think this is the reason why i called it the most non mo most useful non sudo verb in the newsletter uh, sudo is a bit of a cheat code because it can attach to anything any kind of compound even kakunin sudo right like we talked about in the newsletter uh previously uh ukagao is its own kind of cheat code right it can do so many different things uh, in particular, it is a kenjogo, kenjogo keigo uh, cheat code because it kind of inherently expresses a level of, of deference while doing a number of different actions. Uh, and it's a really easy kind of path into keigo. As I mentioned at the top, I really do think, especially new students, need a kind of simplified way to conceive of keigo when they're first starting to learn. And the simplest thing that you can do is ask yourself, whose action am I describing with the language I'm about to use? Is it an action I'm taking? Or is it an action my conversation partner is taking? If it's someone else, you will need that sonkeigo verb, that honorific keigo verb, to express the level of respect for them, assuming that it's the, a person that needs that kind of respect, right? Like a boss or uh, a teacher or something like that. If it's just your friend, you don't need to be using Kegel. Uh, if you are the subject, if you are doing the action uh, and you're in a situation that requires Kegel, odds are you need a humble verb to express deference about your own actions. Uh, Ukagao has this level of deference built into the core verb meanings to hear, to listen, and to ask, and to visit. Uh, and those are, are actions that are very useful. And uh, take, a t take some time to learn some of the phrases and see uh, some other phrases where it can be used and you'll have a head start for Kego. That's it for the newsletter this month. I have a couple of Ido Ido things. Uh, Murakami did not win the Nobel Prize again. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, maybe, maybe fortunately, I don't know. But I did start up my close blogging of his memoir, Distant Drums, again. Uh, check out the latest post on the blog. It's a really interesting look uh, at when Murakami was leaving Japan. Uh, he wrote this book at, at a bunch of different times, right? So at times you can tell, okay, he's very close to the moment of action when he was in Europe. And then uh, at other times, the, in the introduction, for example, it's several, several years after. And so he's clearly looking back over his time and writing about it and very interesting to look at him getting ready to leave japan all the work he had to do to wrap up his life here before going to live abroad for three years um, i also put a link to the shiba ryotaro memorial museum here in osaka uh, which i went to see um, a couple weekends ago i was not all that familiar with the writer shiba ryotaro um, he was extremely prolific wrote tons and tons of, of novels and uh, nonfiction. Uh, but the museum came up in a search for Ando Tadao buildings in Osaka. And it's in this kind of small old neighborhood off a local stop on the Kintetsu Nara line. And the Ando building is right next to Shiba's actual house and garden. And uh, it, it's really an incredible little space. And they have the best bookshelves in Japan, which are, are worth a trip alone. And this is m me putting into uh, practice more of my own advice, which is kind of get out there and see Japan while you're here. Uh, and then the final uh, kind of iro iro that I, that I would share is, uh, I'm in the middle of reading Matt Alt's excellent essay for Eon titled, The Joy of Clutter, about the true state of homes in Japan, kind of like debunking Japanese minim minimalism. Uh, he had the chance to interview a frequent Murakami collaborator, Kyoichi Tezuki, who did the excellent book, Tokyo Style. This is basically a photo collection of apartments in Tokyo from the early 90s. I always associate it with that kind of hip uh, bookstore, record store, kind of ephemera store called Village Vanguard that are still around, but I think are, were maybe slightly more popular in the early 2000s because that book was always on the shelves there. Uh, it's, it's great. You have to go pick up a copy, just amazing photos of what it's actually like to live in Japan. I'm almost certain I've had multiple copies of that book. 
uh, because I used to buy them and give them to friends and family as gifts. So go check out that book. Go check out Matt's essay uh, for the book. I, I did a little quick check on Mercari for you. And they're going from some anywhere between 800 to 2,000 yen. So not going to set you back too much. So that's all I've got for this month. Uh, looking forward to talking to you again in November when it's even more pleasant outside. And hopefully we're starting to get some fall leaves by then. Talk to you soon.